to be together here this morning. Those of us who are here on campus or to be online, to be God's people and to be in community and to celebrate the truths that we just did. I love that song. I think that's one of my absolute favorites. And so we're just really, really blessed with that. Um, Love last Sunday also that we were able to celebrate baptisms together and people taking their next step with Jesus and declaring exactly the things that we just talked about, that Jesus is our living hope, that he's broken every chain, that he's given us new life. So thank you everybody who was able to be there to encourage those who were baptized. For those of you who took that next step of following Jesus, we're so excited with you. So just wanted to mention that. That was an awesome part of our church life and community together. We started talking last week about the theme of anger and how dealing with it, expressing it, where to go with it is a really pressing matter in our world. It's a very real thing. and In fact, so real that there's some people that have seen it and wanted to capitalize on it, want to make some money off of the fact that people are angry. Consider the Schimpfloss company out of Germany. A couple of guys came together and they realized, man, people are really angry. They are coming home from work and they're steamed and they're full up to here. They don't know where to go with this. And so when they get home, then where do they go with it? And of course, it's their spouse, it's their kids, it's the dog, whatever. So again, they developed this company, this hotline that you could call and you can just let her fly and you can rage Schimpfloss being translated into English, swear away. All right, so here we go. You understand what they're after. In fact, the people that answer the phone lines are even encouraged to to prod and to encourage people on so that if somebody calls in and they feel like they're not really letting it out, they want to bait them and say, is that all you got? You really mad? Come on, give give it to us. And yikes. I mean, on one level, it's kind of moderately humorous, But at the same time, it's kind of sad, isn't it? It's sad that our world is filled with so much anger and people that don't know what to do with it and where to go with it to the point that people have to develop these crazy hotlines so that they do something maybe at least a little bit better with it than go home and let their family have it. So last week, we looked at the book of Proverbs and what God's Word has to say about our anger. We saw the dangers specifically that come and are presented from what we described to be unrestrained anger. And we wanted to be really careful to nuance things correctly and talk about unrestrained anger as opposed to just anger in general because the scriptures are clear to us that there is a right time and a place to be angry. There's lots of times in the Bible where God himself is angry at sin and injustice in the world. And so there are times where we're actually reflecting God's image by being angry about the right things. So what we're talking about, though, is the dangers of unrestrained anger, handling anger, whether it be justified or unjustified, in the wrong way. So according to Proverbs, there were several dangers that we wanted to be aware of. First, unrestrained anger displays immaturity, foolishness on our part, a part of our character that is yet to be shaped by Jesus. Unrestrained anger also creates conflict. I think we we all live that out on a weekly basis, don't we? I mean, you let someone have it at home or at work or whatever, and we see it just fans the flame. So it creates conflict. And then, of course, it just opens the door for us committing sin of many different kinds. Sadly, in this world, we see all kinds of violence towards people, even murder because of unrestrained anger. I was reminded this week just by various conversations and this topic coming up in the message just how real this is. This is not metaphorical and it's not certainly something that's dealt with out there amongst those people. This is something that you and I are all a part of regardless of our temperament or the way that we may in and of our particular background and nature want to deal with anger. We talked about the fact that we've got some of us who are spewers. We just let it out. That's part of who we are. We run hot. There's other of us who are stuffers, right? And we just hold it all in. But we want to be careful never to think that, oh, that doesn't mean we deal with anger. No, it's just, again, we're different temperaments. Some people are letting it out. Some people are holding it in. 
we all face the reality of the presence of anger, how to deal with it. Ultimately, we ask the question twofold. One, what do we do when we blow it? Is there anybody that can help us, that can cleanse us when we make mistakes? And then the other question is, is there someone that can actually help us so that we can be different? So that we can be different. So today we're going to continue on and study in Proverbs. We want to look at some of the guardrails that the scriptures provide to us that continue to provide to us protection. See, God gives us ways that we can put protective boundaries around our anger wherein we can use and shepherd this powerful emotion correctly. So we want to see what Proverbs has to say about that. But before we do, let's pray. Let's just ask that God will speak to us. Lord, we open our hearts to you. The absolute right next step with Jesus always is to make sure that every last area of our lives is open to you. And so one of the areas that for all of us to some degree, and maybe for some of us, even in particular, anger and saying, Lord, speak, is something that needs to happen. Would you speak to all of us exactly what we need to hear? We invite your presence. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So let's consider some of the guardrails that Proverbs provides to us to help us deal with anger in the right way when it rises. The first is this. When anger comes, we want to hold our tongue. We want to hold our tongue. And this is actually a major, I would call one of the mega themes in the book of Proverbs. It's going to come up almost like every other verse if you're reading and studying. Proverbs 29, 11 was kind of a theme verse right in the middle of this whole discussion of anger. Fools give full vent to their rage, but when the wise, or but the wise, forgive me, bring calm in the end. So we have this idea of fools giving full vent to their spirit, to their rage. What's the primary vent of the Spirit? It's our mouths, isn't it? Where is that venting going to come? It's with the tongue. And so when that anger starts to boil, that's one of the first places that we want to go by way of setting guardrails. If you cap the vent, at least certain things and certain collateral damage is restrained. Because there's all kinds of things happen when we let our words out in an uncontrolled manner. It's easy when we're angry to say things that we don't mean and to hurt people. So we see Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. A violent image, isn't it? But it's to the point, no pun intended. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Angry and foolish words can also turn around and hurt us. So not only can we bludgeon other people, like the boomerang comes back around and knocks us out. Proverbs 18, 6, the lips of fools bring them strife and their mouths invite a beating. Anybody ever said anything that you thought, I'm going to really get them, and then before we knew it, we were the one lying on the floor. Our words can hurt us. And then angry words, more, more times than not, are just going to make an already hot situation more volatile, right? So Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So there's any number of reasons why controlling our tongues, learning to hold our words is the right thing. James chapter 1, sometimes people call James the Proverbs of the New Testament, is going to pick up on this theme also. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Open ears, always a good thing. But be slow to speak and slow to become angry. Do you see how close those are tied together? Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know, in our day, we need to remember that included with controlling the tongue is controlling our thumbs. Yeah? Controlling our thumbs. Although a dear sister after the service said, remember Zach, that not all of us can text with two thumbs. Some of us are still pecking away depending on our generation. I don't care how you engage with your phone, smart device, you know what we're talking about. The digital age has entered all kinds of danger as it relates to anger. 
you mix the immediacy of communication in a digital form with the fact that we can say things to people who can't right in that moment strike us back or that we don't actually have to look them in the eye and you have a pretty lethal combination. Throw on top of that autocorrect, yeah? Anybody had any autocorrect adventures? Those are really fun. That's a whole nother sermon, right? But in all seriousness, I mean, we've got to slow down and be really aware of this because some of us have just like a, a need for a chip to be installed that this is really, really dangerous. I think it, some kind of equation like this, digital plus anger equals double danger is safe to say. Digital plus anger is going to equal double danger. So with digital, we need to be applying all the old wisdom of written communication and more. Like, don't send an angry email or text without sleeping on it, right? Or at least let somebody, loved one, friend, read it first if you do need to communicate something. I don't think Daniel Tiger has any songs about how long to wait or count before you text, but um, I think at least 40 minutes, at least. Cool down, right? Discipleship step, really, really practical. Think about just handing your phone over to your spouse or a friend and say, look through my last week's communications. What do you see? What's the tone? Like, how do I, how do I sound? And if they're coming back going, did you know that all caps means this? You know, that kind of thing. It's just, it's a helpful thing because people, an outside voice can help us. Now, I think a addition to this, a, a, a subline here that I think is important is that holding your tongue doesn't necessarily mean stuffing it and holding things in forever because we got any number of Proverbs that talks about honesty, right? Truthfulness, not being flattering to people. So this is not at all a teaching of like, oh, it's all okay. This is not that, okay? Matthew 18, and most translations there will remind us that if someone, brother or sister, sins against us, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go to that person, aren't we? And we're supposed to talk with them. But of course, it's about the right timing. It's about having time to cool down and to speak to the issue clearly and with truth I mean, godliness. Sometimes if the issue is, is difficult or we need to kind of unpack it at a first run before we talk to someone directly, a friend, counselor can be the right place to go. And of course, always the Lord is there with a ready ear to hear us. Psalms is a book of all kinds of blessing and peace, but if you read it from start to finish, Psalms is also an angry book. Have you read some of these Psalms? It's full of a whole lot of people that are pretty heated about the world and about the way that people have treated them. There's people that are angry with God. And they're just expressing to him in the exact right place the reality of what's going on there in that they can be ministered to by the truth of God. Calling all stuffers here for the moment, and I feel like I can preach to the stuffers simply because this is me, second child, middle kid, or whatever. This has been my strategy through the years. I think this is really important for us. And I think it's important for those of us who are stuffers not to think the fact that just because we have learned to lock our jaw better than the spears around us, that somehow that is an immediate sign of godliness, okay? It doesn't take anything to just literally put a staple in your lip, okay? You can still have all kinds of rage and anger in your heart, and nothing good comes there. Anger will come out somewhere, someplace, sometime. And so for those of us, again, with that particular tendency, we want to remember, it's not that we've just got this under control. Yeah, we might have some of the guardrail that comes maybe a little more naturally to us by way of just controlling our tongue, but there's still a whole lot of work in this, and we have got to open up our lives to the Lord to say, okay, how do I handle anger in the right way? because stuffers often get it just as wrong as the spears, but just backwards. So places that we can go with our anger, absolutely. We're getting it out at the right place in the right time. But in the moment of heat, in the moment of heat, I believe Proverbs says that it's almost always better to hold our tongues. Another guardrail that we're going to see is this. Let it go. Let it go. I love Proverbs 19 and then also 
Proverbs 12, two different verses. First, 11 of 19. A person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Love, love that wording. It is to a person's honor and glory that they overlook an offense that comes their way. And likewise, Proverbs 12, 16, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. We live in a world and in a culture that is waiting and ready, and in fact, sometimes happy to be offended because we want to let the anger out. As I was reading these verses, I couldn't help but go back to Disney's classic, The Lion King. All right? There's a character in The Lion King. I think we've almost all seen this in Grandmas and Grandpas and whatnot. I'll do my best to describe it to you. But Pumbaa is a character that everybody loves. But despite our love for him, he is smelly and he is ugly because Pumbaa is a warthog. He's supposed to be smelly. He's supposed to be ugly. But yes, Pumbaa is a warthog. But one of my favorite moments in the movie is someone comes, another character, and says, hey, who's the pig? To which Pumbaa is righteously indignant. He is incredibly angry. You talking to me? You talking to me? They call me Mr. Pig, right? I'm, I'm not just a pig. Who are you talking? They call me Mr. Pig. And I just, I think that that is so telling of the world in which we live. Who are we to think that, you know, we deserve to be the king and the queen and the empress and the emperor of the world and we're walking around thinking that the whole world is going to treat us that way and roll out the red carpet? They call me Mr. Pig, by the way. And here we are with these Proverbs reminding us, don't walk around like that. Don't take such easy offense at everything that comes your way. Proverbs 20, verse 3 is going to say, it's to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Derek Kidner, who I mentioned last week, fantastic Old Testament commentator, great in the Proverbs because he kind of is able to put in a nutshell what's being said. He said the person in Proverbs 20 verse 3 is a person who sits next to the fire. They're just waiting to be lit up, to be lit on fire. They are waiting to be offended. They want a fight. And of course, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 says, In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. That last phrase there, do not give the devil a foothold, is really chilling if you think about it. Because for those of us who walk with Jesus, I mean, the enemy is is the one that, that we fear and we 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 hate and we resist. And yet here the verse says, you may very well be someone who aids and abets him. How so? Through anger that's not dealt with correctly. Our adversary Satan absolutely loves easily offended people. He would love to put you to use. In your marriage, in your home, he would love to set you loose in our church. Friends, Let's not be these people. Could we be people who first assume the best, remembering the world doesn't revolve around us anyways. Most offenses are just misperceived. They're not intended at all. Could we be people who, in moments where we are legitimately ruffled, that are confident in Christ, who can wear... I might picture it this way, spiritual Kevlar. Do you remember Kevlar is this incredible material that's used as body armor. It can stop bullets and just immense trajectories because there's so many woven, perfect, twisted fibers that just things can't get through. And wouldn't that be amazing if just any insults that flew our way, because we're confident in Jesus, just, it's okay. I'm, I'm not gonna let Satan use that to distract. Can we be people who carry around with us, according to the image from last week, remember we had a a gas can and a fire extinguisher. Can we be people that just don't bring the gas can with us everywhere we go, simply to stoke the flames and say, oh, I'm offended and it feels so good to let out all the anger that I have been stuffing. And be people who continually say, Jesus, I just want to bring peace. And one of the ways I can bring peace is to glorify you by displaying the glory 
of overlooking an offense. Ultimately, friends, can we be people like Christ? Because 1 Peter 2.23 reminds us this. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I love that verse because I feel that Jesus displays to us the healthy response to insults. And these were real insults. So we've been talking a lot about perceived insults. I mean, Jesus received all kinds of awful, evil things thrown at him by the Pharisees and the powers that were in his day. But what I love is that it says that Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So as Jesus was forbearing, as Jesus did not retaliate in those moments, it was not as if Jesus was saying, oh, it's okay. That's okay that you tell all kinds of lies about me and you disdain who I am as the son. No, nothing like that. It's simply that he did not retaliate in those moments and he entrusted himself to the just judge, the only one who would settle all things in the end. He's the perfect perfect example to us of how to healthily deal with anger and certainly with how to properly let it go another guardrail for us is this consider your inputs consider your input so i'm i'm uh, encouraged challenged by proverbs 20 24 through 25 that says do not make friends with a hot-tempered person do not associate with one easily angered or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. This is the inverse of the iron sharpens iron principle. Do you remember the, 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 the right way that relationships are supposed to work is that friends are supposed to encourage each other, strengthen each other. The relationship goes somewhere good. But the opposite is always true. As much as walking with the wise will make you wise, walking with fools and walking with people who are foolish as regards anger is going to rub off on you. You walk with angry people, you are going to get angry. Really good question to ponder is what are the nature of the conversations that I have with the people that I call my friends? The small group that I meet with, the the Bible study that I'm in, any relationship that I have. Are these conversations uplifting? Do they grow your, your faith? Do they encourage you to look at the world the way that Jesus looks at the world and to trust God who is sovereign and good? Or are they conversations that perpetually fan the flames and foster anger in you? Is the gathering that you are a part of on a weekly or monthly basis of the nature that simply talks about how bad the world is and how bad it's getting and you know what's wrong with the world? It's those people. It's not us. I mean, it certainly wouldn't be us. It's them. They're the people that are messing everything up or maybe you're sitting across from a friend and they are the ones that continually say you know what you are right and you're the victim and you deserve better than that you should rage you should get revenge Man, it's fast and easy to be in those kind of relationships maybe we think that we're we're far too mature for that kind of situation but are we i think it's safe to say that we if we spend Anytime consuming media, we are likely to be spending time with angry friends these days. We listen to angry friends all the time. Online, with cable news, social media posts, email forwards. Anger sells. Anger turns a good profit. And if it sells, someone's consuming it. Who's consuming it? It, It's us. It's you. It's me. And so we want to be really careful of our temptation to consume anger. And then not just to consume it, but to become it. To become it. Another really practical discipleship step. I've heard of people who recently have just said, I am just turning off the news by way of most of its popular forms. I'm done. It is just too angry and volatile. Now, right away, someone will say, we need to be informed. We need to know what's going on. Absolutely. Point taken. However, I will challenge you as a response to that, this. If we are being informed by people who are fundamentally angry, then aren't we just being informed by fools? 
at least according to Proverbs, that's not a good place to be. There are amazing and responsible and peaceable sources wherein we can stay up to date with what's going on because absolutely, true enough, we need to know what's going on. Likewise, some of those people who are writing are righteously angry. It's just they've allowed Jesus to shape the way that they respond. And so what they write and what they say, yes, while they're feeling it, is being expressed in a godly way. So look for those sources. They exist, but watch for the other ones. You know, we talk here regularly about being discipled. That's what we mean by following Jesus one step at a time. But it's important for all of us to realize that what we're talking about here is not like a one-sided issue. So as to say that if we decide, well, we're not going to be discipled by Jesus, or we decide, you know, I'm not going to be serious about being discipled by Jesus, that then I will live in a vacuum and I won't be discipled by anything or anyone. No, the reality of the situation is all of us, day by day, whether intentionally or unintentionally, are being discipled. We're either choosing to be discipled by Jesus, and that is who we long to be discipled by, or by default, or by choice, we're going to be discipled by somebody else. If not Jesus, then we're going to be discipled by friends, or in this case, we're going to be discipled by cable news, by TikTok, by podcasts. And then what we're wanting to ask ourselves is this, are these sources angry? Am I angry? These are really critical questions to ask because there is a direct connect, and don't fool yourself to believe anything different. This is going to lead us to the ultimate guardrail, which in fact is more than a guardrail. But it's this. If we're wondering how we can really and truly address anger in our lives and respond correctly when it rises, we want to take one more step with Jesus. We want to take one more step with Jesus. I want you to read with me two verses. Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. So I want you to look at that word, patient. Proverbs 17, 27. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. I want you to focus in on that word, even-tempered. The ESV will translate that cool spirit. I like that one. One with understanding has a cool spirit. Now, legitimately, some of this can be helped with strategies like we've mentioned from the likes of Daniel Tiger. You're feeling super angry and you're going to roar, count to four. It's going to be better than nothing, right? And it's going to start getting you in the right direction. Okay, fair enough. Likewise, patience can be practiced. I've heard of people doing things as crazy as walking into the grocery store and stepping to the line that is the longest, okay? And then saying, all right, Jesus, I just wanted to practice a little bit. Walk me through this here. Here we go. You know, a little bit of, little bit of spiritual weightlifting. So those things can be really good. They can have their place. But ultimately, as we look at the descriptors in those two verses, what we're talking about is not someone who has just developed guardrails, but even further, who have developed character traits. You see, there's something called the muscling out of patience. That's, that's one thing. That's where we talked about sometimes the tendency of stuffers to think that they've gotten somewhere just by learning how to do lockjaw, right? But there's something completely different in and of the character, the nature that has been formed to truly be patient and to truly be even-tempered. See, this is where ultimately we need transformation, not just guardrails. We need heart change. We need a new birth. And you and I don't have a prayer of bringing that about in our lives on our own. So what we want to remember is that while the book of Proverbs offers us much moral teaching, that's not its ultimate end point. In fact, all moral teaching of Scripture is, yes, a blessed North Star. It's where we're headed, but ultimately it's designed to remind us that I can never get there. I can't ever make that jump from earth to heaven and accomplish everything that is pictured morally in the scriptures or in the book of Proverbs. 
what its ultimate goal is, is to draw our eyes and our attention to Christ. Christ, who is the bright and morning star, the star who actually stepped from heaven down to earth to give us that new birth. And so it's through the cross and the resurrection work of Jesus that this happens. First, he forgives us for all our blunders and all the wrong ways that we've handled our anger. So there's an answer for that. And then for the fact that we need to be righteous in God's sight, that's not something that's waiting to happen if we get everything right. No, Jesus clothes us with his perfections. The fact that he always and perfectly handled his anger correctly. That's put on us. We're clothed with that. We don't deserve it. So now we stand in perfect relationship with God. It's secure. And then in the midst of being God's blessed children, secure because of Jesus' work for us, now he disciples us and he walks through us and he puts his Holy Spirit within us so that we can be changed. We mentioned again last week that some of the anger that we experience in our lives is from really deep and painful things that we have experienced in life. I mean, some, there's some really wretched things that some of us have been through. And what I love the fact is that God doesn't just say, well, I, I don't know, Proverbs says figure it out. No. In our relationship with Jesus, he just pours his love and his ministry out to us so as to say, my child, I care. I care, I care so much and want to bring a healing and a touch. I, I also care that I, I don't want you to just go off the rails with your anger because that's not going to help either. But he steps in and brings his ministry to our hearts. Author Gordon MacDonald <clears throat> writes of, of the need for each and every one of us to address the potential volcano or potential volcanoes in our hearts. Now, specifically, he says that each of us need to be watchful for what he describes as the Eafiatla Yokotols in our heart. All right? Now, this is not some weird psychological term that he came up with, but if you will remember, the Eafiatla Yokotol, I practiced that all week, so I think I got it right. All right? If you remember the news, 2010, there's this volcano in Iceland. All right? I don't remember. Did that picture work this time? You know what? Look it up <clears throat> afterwards. If you can spell Eafiatla Yokotol, look it up. This volcano that wasn't even that big of a volcano, and it wasn't even that like grand of, of volcanic activity, blew. And again, it's in Iceland, this country that most people say, I Iceland, whatever, whatever can happen in Iceland. It's not going to happen or affect anywhere else. No, this thing blows and it shuts Europe down for an entire week. I don't know if this brings back any of, any of your memories there. And this was just such a great reminder to us. And Gordon MacDonald just did such a great job in saying, look, don't be thinking of your anger like, oh, it's not that big of a deal when it's in Iceland. No, your anger is there and it's real. And when that blows in the ways that God says it's not supposed to blow, it's going to spread ash and it's going to impact way more than just you and your little world. It's going to impact the worlds of other people. He says, it's, stakes are too high. Just simply to say, ah, you know what, I only blow up every once in a while. You know, it's not that big of a deal. No. No. The end of these two weeks, this is the question that I want each and every one of us to ask. Are we willing to take this next step with Jesus and invite him into the potential volcano, volcanoes of our lives? Yes, we want to grow in learning to control our tongues. Yes, we want to learn to let things go. Absolutely, we want to consider our inputs. But more than anything, we want to ask Jesus to disciple us and to speak to the anger in our lives and to shape it, to ask if real heart change is happening at a base level. Jesus, bring insight to me, we pray. Bring your power and healing to bear to this area of my life. Maybe we want to ask him of some practical steps that we need to take. We've mentioned a few of them, but we may need to grab a, a friend this week and get honest. There is a volcano in my life. I've been neglecting it for 20 years, but it's spreading ash over everything and everybody that I live with and who I love. Help me. 
So last week I had a conversation with a friend and we were just talking about, hey, how things were, how were things going? And I just appreciated his honesty because he simply said, you know what, today was a horrible, no good, very bad day. And guess what? I was just angry from start to finish and made my wife cry and all the above. And I know how I feel when I get honest like that. I think this other person is going to think I'm just crazy and they're going to think I'm so immature and I'm such a mess. Why did I ever open up? You know what I thought about that friend when they were real with me like that? I said, here is a godly man who's getting real and he is going to get somewhere. He's going to get somewhere with Jesus because he was real enough to say, I I just need to tell you what was going on in my life. We may need to talk to a pastor or a Christian counselor because as we have shared, there is anger and sometimes if it's connected to really tough stuff from the past, we need some like unpacking and just people who are trained to pull layers away. Don't look down at all on the ministry of counselors that are trained for that. God can use them. There's no shame there. Specifically, even something you could do is, is use one of our, our green cards here. We have these in the back of the seats in front of you. We've kind of designed these. We want to keep talking about them as a, a next step. Um, sometimes you might just write on here, I'd like to receive a call from a, a pastor. I envision maybe you know you need to talk to a friend, but you know that by tomorrow morning you're going to have convinced yourself that what you felt God was speaking to you in the sermon was just your imagination. Um, don't do that. Write down, like right after this service, and, and put on here, anger, help, and walk it over to your friend in your small group and say, on Thursday, I want you to ask me about this green card, and then tell me, I better not lie to me because you felt like the Holy Spirit was talking to you after the sermon. I don't know what it is, but Jesus knows a potential next step for you, and he is the one who has the power and the grace to meet you where you are. Once again, we talk about taking next steps with Jesus on a a regular basis. And many times in the church, we tend to think towards, you know what, I'm going to join a Bible study this fall. Wonderful, please do. I'm going to spend more time in the Word and in devotion. Absolutely, please, please go there. But sometimes we don't go the distance and really open the barn doors and say, Jesus... Is there any really nitty-gritty you need to get into here? Like anger? Is that the real next step that you want me to take? For all of us, our lives won't be the same for inviting Jesus to look at our anger. We we really should, because it's a, a real thing. But I'm pretty convinced also that for some of us, maybe in some unique ways, a completely new life, a new destiny, a new ministry awaits. If we were to say simply this morning, you know, Jesus, help, and then obey his next word.